Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. I drag my suitcase through yet another airport, marveling at the fact that the cheap Christmas decorations in this one resembled the ones at the other two airports I'd seen this week. For some reason, some genius decided that blasting Christmas songs over the airport's sound system was a good idea. Just hearing that Britney Spears whining to Santa about her Christmas wish only seemed to depress me even more. One of the wheels on my suitcase was either stuck or just not rolling, so I was doing more dragging than rolling it. I checked in at the counter and found that my flight would be taking off on time. That was amazing and the best news of the week which only served to show how terrible my life is. This isn't the way my life was supposed to be going. I'm pushing 40, stuck in a job that's going nowhere, involuntarily divorced, and on the edge of depression. I haven't been on a date in two months, unless you count those two nights last week when I fell asleep in front of the TV with my cat. I really think this should count because it is a male cat. That makes him a member of the opposite sex. And he acts just like a man too. As soon as we were done eating, he tried to cop a feel. I was half awake when I noticed that the cat got a really intense look on his face and started rubbing my left boob. Okay. I dropped tuna from my sandwich on it, but he was still trying to feel me. According to my life plan, I should be working on my second perfect child by now, instead of slogging my way through another airport. The holidays are the worst time to fly. I guess it's seeing all of those happy smiling faces. All of these people heading off to be with their families, while I'm just trying to put food on the table and keep the bills paid. As I sit down in the lounge to wait to be called to board my plane, I look around the boarding area. The decor looks like the decor in a hundred other similar areas. I've been doing this for so long that all airports and hotels look the same to me. I spot him out of the corner of my eye as I reach for my purse to get my phone. A guy, a few years younger than I am, smiles as he approaches me. He's probably about 35. I wish I'd grabbed my compact instead of the phone so I could make sure my makeup isn't smudged. But shit, he's the one smiling at me. If he didn't like what he saw, he wouldn't be grinning. Well, maybe he would if he was trying to sell me something. I sit up straight and look at him as he approaches. He isn't bad looking. His hair is a light blonde. I prefer dark hair on men, but I can't afford to be choosy. Actually, until he lit up when he looked at me, I'd begun to think that I was too far over the hill. He slows down a bit as he gets closer to me, so I smile. I don't give him my full thousand megawatt smile because I don't want him to think I'm desperate or a professional. I just give him the friendly version. Hi. I say cheerfully as he gets within speaking range. He looks at me strangely and walks right by me. As my shock wears off, I notice that his smile and the way his face lit up weren't for me at all. Did you miss me? He asks the woman standing just behind me. Hmm. She replies cheerfully. Who was that woman who spoke to you? She asks. The hell if I know, he shrugs. Just some weird old airport woman, I guess. Let's go home so I can show you how much I missed you. I can't wait, she gushes. We might not make it all the way home. As the happy couple saunters away from me, I can't help but grit my teeth. I hate that witch. Then I realized that it was just my jealousy coming to the forefront of my consciousness. She was basking in and enjoying the fact that she had a man who loved her. He loved her so much that being away from her made him long to be with her again. They'd go home and try to screw each other's brains out. But there would be more to it than that. Their union would be one of joy and sharing. They would literally open themselves to each other and share their souls. It would be so much more than just two healthy beings slapping against each other until they released fluids. That kind of thing was very special. So maybe I was jealous of the witch, but I didn't really hate her. In fact, I used to be her, and that's the problem. I knew intimately what she had and I'd give anything to get that back. The thing that almost made me cross that border into hating her was the fact that unlike me, she was smart enough to know what she had and treasure it. After they left, I looked around at the other passengers in the boarding area. A couple of them looked at me sheepishly. They'd probably seen my embarrassing little drama as it unfolded. Well, I was really glad that my embarrassment and my very human mistake could bring some happiness or some entertainment to their lives. Other than seeing me embarrass myself, I was sure that none of them would have given me a second look. I guess that I was nearing the age when women developed their special powers. Apparently mine were kicking in early. Women over 40, unless they're extremely beautiful, well-built, or rich, all get the power of invisibility. The only ones immune to our powers are our families. Everyone else can look right at us and simply not see us. Once we get that old, young men don't consider us sex objects, and since they think about sex most of the time, we don't exist. Young women don't want to be like us, so we don't exist in their world either. 
Men our age all want younger women, and we don't want men who are too much older than us. The funny thing is that if given the choice, the men who are older than us would mostly pick younger women too, if they could get them. The boarding area fills up quickly as the time for the flight to depart gets closer. I pull my briefcase and purse closer to me as the seating area becomes more congested. I wonder about my family for perhaps the fourth time this week. What happened to us? After my parents died, we seemed to lose track of each other. I have a brother and a sister out there somewhere. I don't know their phone numbers or even where they live. Okay, that isn't totally true. My sister lives somewhere in the South. And my brother lives in prison. I'm not sure which one, though I do know that he'll be there for a long time. He got caught doing something with drugs. He was supposed to be the smart one too. I also have a vague memory of some aunts and I think, an uncle that are still alive, but I wouldn't even begin to know where to look. I guess what got me to thinking about all of this was that hokey movie that I woke up and watched one night last week when my cat was taking a break from fondling my tuna smeared tits. It was one of those movies where the spirit of Christmas gives this guy who had almost died trying to save some old lady a wish. I'm telling you it was hokey. I know that most of you are thinking that the guy asked for a gazillion dollars, right? Not a million, not a billion, a gazillion dollars, right? Enough money to buy your own country and buy enough people to live in your country too. But nope, the guy only wanted one thing. Stop me if you've seen this movie. All he wanted was to have a nice Christmas with his family, one more time. Like me, his family was scattered all over everywhere. They had their own lives and careers and kids and all of that real-life normal shit. Over the years, they drifted apart and become strangers. They only got together when someone died and then only for the funeral and to decide who got what of the dead relative shit. I guess in my own way I've been wondering whether or not things like that really ever happen. And if they do, do they ever happen for people like me? Because you see, more than anything else in the world I wish that I had my own Christmas wish like that idiot in the movie. And no, I wouldn't waste mine on money either. Don't get me wrong, I don't want world peace. The world's economy is already bad enough. We could use a good war about now to crank things back up. And if you're thinking I want to get my family back together again, you're out of your mind. That gang of losers and freeloaders should really stay away from me if they know what's good for them. I can only think of one thing I'd wish for and strangely enough, I threw it away stupidly myself. Shit. Stupid teenaged girls who don't look where they're going should all be killed. The little witch is as big as I am, and she just tramped all over my foot and kept walking. Holy shit, she's bigger than I am. Was my bum that big when I was her age? And the little witch didn't have the manners to even apologize. She just walked right by showing her friend a poster of some little girl she bought at the gift shop. Who the hell is Justine Beaver? Oh, it's Justin Bieber and he's a guy. I remember him now. We had another version of him about three or four years ago. Yep, only then his name was Jesse McCarthy. Shit, at least Jesse had a hit. What was the name of that song? Oh yeah, it was called, How Do You Sleep? I played that song over and over again a while ago. It helped to take the edge off of my problem. But now it really has been a year. Anyway, back to my one wish, if I had one wish. I'd wish for one chance to get back with my ex. Just like the words in that song. It's been about a year now. Ain't seen or heard from you. I've been missing you crazy. How do you sleep? I wondered all kinds of things about Jared. I wondered if he ever thought about me. I wondered if he missed me. I wondered if he had any regrets about the way he just threw our marriage away. If he had it to do all over again, would he have given me a second chance? Statistics say that most people are miserable after a divorce. I know that I am. But they say that even the people who wanted the divorces are unhappy. 8 out of 10 of the people who go through a divorce say that if they had to do it again, they'd work harder to save their marriages. I wondered if Jared felt like that. More than anything else, I miss him at night and in the morning when I first wake up. I'm not just talking about sex, although the sex with Jared was amazing. More than anything else, I miss having that man lay down and wrap his arms around me and hold me through the night. Nothing else mattered when I was in his arms. The bills didn't matter. The job didn't matter. Nothing did. Even on days when he went out for a run and just fell into bed still sweaty, I craved that man's touch. And I know he loved me. He was a really good-looking guy and smart as hell, but for some reason he loved me. And like in the song, it has been almost exactly a year since I've seen him. He didn't even come to court. I never had a chance to explain or apologize or even talk to him. I can still see the look on his face. That last look haunts me to this day. I looked up as the woman behind the counter's loudspeaker distorted voice announced boarding for my flight. Like all the other robots, I shuffled listlessly into the line forming in front of the door. 
Despite what you see on TV or hear on the radio, chivalry is dead. Several young men leaped in front of me to get a better position in line. Okay, I know I'm not Jennifer Aniston, but is it really that manly to push your way past a woman struggling with a heavy briefcase and a purse? And if you do manage to get in line ahead of her, what do you get? The plane won't take off until all of the passengers have boarded. If you're traveling coach or economy, you won't get upgraded because you got on the plane first. They should have a special award for douchebags like that. Let's call it the DB Trophy. It can be the Heisman Trophy for douchebags, dickheads, and a-holes worldwide. I can see it now. We'll have a ceremony on ESPN or Fox. The announcer will say, and for knocking down a 40-year-old woman dragging her luggage through an airport boarding line, the award goes to. Insert the name of dickhead here. Maybe I was just cranky at the thought of spending another holiday season alone. I really shouldn't let things like this bother me. It never used to when I was married. All I thought about back then was getting back home to Jared. Of course, I traveled a lot less than two. I only went on the road if it was absolutely necessary. Now that I'm divorced, I have no reason to stay home and be depressed, so I travel more. Then again, maybe since I'm traveling so much, I get more exposure to the douchebags. As I settled into my place in line, I saw one of those exceptions. One of those guys who give us hope. There was a guy up about eight places in line ahead of me who'd gotten there because he was standing near the door when it opened. He pulled a woman who was even older than me into line ahead of him. When the young douchebag behind him started to make a fuss about it, the guy turned and glared at him. The young douchebag was so shocked that he just shut up. I think that I was more shocked than the douchebag was. I felt the weirdest tingling going from my feet all the way up the back of my neck. The man who'd stood up to the douchebags was a medium-sized guy. He wasn't big by any stretch of the imagination, but not small either. He had brown hair that seemed to have a nice shine to it. His eyes were soft and brown as well. This couldn't be considered love at first sight since it wasn't the first time I'd seen him. I'd seen him hundreds, make that thousands of times, both physically and in my dreams. It appeared for some strange reason that the spirit of Christmas had heard my whining and responded. My ex moss wish was coming true. The man who'd stood up to the douchebag was my ex-husband, Jared. It was surreal, standing only a few feet away from him. On one hand, I wanted to rush over to him and hug the living shit out of him. I wanted to tell him that our year apart was over and we could get back together again and both of our lives would be better. I wanted to tell him that I understood what I'd done and I'd learned from it. Not only had I learned from it, but I'd suffered from it and I'd do anything I had to do to make sure that it never happened again. On the other hand, I needed to be smarter than that. I had to look at this logically. I needed to assess the situation and not just go in half-cocked. There was bound to be some anger or resentment on his part. He might not be ready to see or speak to me yet. Looking at him, I can see that he wasn't the same old Jared. But shit, I wasn't the same old Audrey. He was thinner. I'm not sure that was a good thing. He wasn't overweight to begin with. I guess we both handled the depression in different ways. I spent a lot of my time lying around eating chocolate so maybe I'd gained 2 or 14 pounds. And maybe my bum had spread a bit and my gut isn't quite as tight as it used to be. It was never that tight to begin with. But I hadn't gone so far that a few weeks of dieting and getting more exercise couldn't reverse the damage. Jared's depression probably had him skipping meals because he was just too tired or just didn't feel like cooking. But it wasn't just that he was thinner, he seemed to have a different mindset as well. He used to be so focused and so energetic. But now, he seemed to be more in control of both himself and his surroundings. He seemed to have matured. At the same time, he lost something. Maybe it was his innocence. I guess that I was probably to blame for that. He trusted me and loved me completely. And I'd simply been unworthy of that trust. My heart was beating like a drum. Just being this close to him again had my mind running through all types of possibilities. It had to be the spirit of Christmas. It had been just over a year, and I hadn't seen or even heard about him from anyone. And now, out of nowhere he pops up. It was a sign. I was sure of it. I needed to be really careful about the way I approached him, though. My track record was impeccable. I seemingly screwed up everything I touched. My life and my marriage were proof of that. I knew, ex moss wish or not, I'd only have one shot at this. As the line started moving and we boarded the plane, luck seemed to be on my side. The flight attendants seemed to be seating everyone according to their tickets. Jared was in business class like I was. And luckily for me the douchebag and his friends, as well as the old lady were all in economy. Jared seemed to also be traveling alone, which gave me another edge. More than likely no one would sit down next to him until all of the available seats had been filled by at least one person. 
Then the seats by the more attractive people would fill in. The seats next to people who were fat, ugly, smelly, or just weird would be the last ones taken. Judging by my place in line, when I got on there should still be empty seats. I'd forego an empty seat to sit next to Jared. As I got on the plane, I noticed the two female flight attendants looking at Jared and then at each other and nodding. As I started down the aisle, just as I got ready to dive into the seat next to Jared, the 350-pound behemoth three passengers ahead of me sat down next to Jared. I was crushed. I didn't know what to do. I sat down across the aisle from the budding Buddha and stewed. I was pissed beyond belief. Why the hell would this fat a-hole want to destroy my ex moss wish by sitting down next to my husband? Was this guy gay or something? I couldn't believe that the spirit of Christmas had set me up like that just to dash my hopes. Somewhere up in the clouds, the spirit of Christmas was probably laughing off at me. Then things got even worse. A young woman walked down the aisle. Even I noticed her as she got on the plane. She had the long blonde hair and big giant eyes and the big everything else. Big obviously fake boobs, a small high-pitched voice, and a habit of laughing at things that weren't remotely funny if the person who said them was male. Even the flight attendants grimaced when the witch got on the plane. As she walked down the aisle, I noticed that the giant next to Jared had his tongue out and he was drooling. I smiled at him. He looked embarrassed that he'd been caught perving on her. I'm surprised that you're not following her, I said. He just shrugged his shoulders and looked at me sheepishly. Seriously, I said. Her name is Tina and she likes big teddy bear type guys. His neck jerked around in her direction so fast I thought his head was about to pop off. I have never seen a guy that big move that fast. If the players on the Lions defensive line could move that quickly, no quarterback in the NFL would be safe. He ran his fat bum to the back of the plane and plopped down in the seat next to Barbie so quickly it looked like he was jet propelled. I don't think his feet touched the floor more than twice in that whole distance. Boy, would he be pissed when he found out that I didn't know anything about that bimbo. I quietly settled into the seat next to my ex-husband. He had his head tilted back and his eyes closed. I don't think he'd recognized me yet. Either that or he just hadn't seen me. I was sure that over the course of a three-hour flight we'd have a chance to talk. All of the seats around us filled in and I found myself smiling. Not only did I smile because my Christmas wish was on track, but I smiled because with all of the seats filled, he couldn't escape. He looked up as the flight attendants gave their usual safety procedure lecture and went over the way we were expected to conduct ourselves while on the plane. Finally, they locked the door and the plane began to taxi forward. Jared released a big breath of air. Do I need to hold your hand? I asked. Are you still nervous about takeoffs and landings? His head turned towards me and our eyes met. In that fraction of a second, I saw him go through recognition, anger, and finally resignation. I'm fine, he said. Then he pulled out a magazine and busied himself reading it. It had been a big step. He now knew that I was there and sitting right next to him. He hadn't cursed at me or tried to get one of the flight attendants to change seats. The giant silver beer can with wings that we were sitting on gained speed and gradually lifted its bulk into the air. Even after all of the flights I've been on, I'm still astonished that something that big can propel itself through the air. The instance where we stop rolling and start flying is one of the most amazing things in the world to me. This plane, like all the others I've been on, made the transition as effortlessly as possible. We gained altitude and then executed a long sweeping bank to align ourselves in the direction of our course. The captain said a few words over the intercom that I was simply not paying attention to. The flight attendants walked up and down the aisles greeting everyone and answering questions. We hadn't been in the air for a full two minutes yet and those fimbits were already annoying me. It took every bit of my cell control not to scream at them for being so goddamn cheerful. Jared, on the other hand, found his magazine mesmerizing. In fact, he hadn't looked up from it even once. Can we talk? I said out of the blue. His brown eyes looked up from his magazine at me. They scanned my face as if looking for something. Whatever he wanted to see there, I hoped to God that he'd find it. What would be the point? He asked. His voice was masked by neutrality. I had no idea of how he felt about talking to me. He could have been seething with anger, wincing in pain, or simply totally disinterested. I just couldn't tell. Jer, we never got a chance to talk. Um, afterwards. I never got the chance to apologize or explain. I didn't get a chance to say anything to you. We never got any form of closure. My shrink says that after a traumatic experience, both parties are in a kind of limbo until they get a chance to come face to face and express their feelings or their viewpoints on the incident to the other concerned party. He looked at me as if he didn't understand what I was saying. His look had no anger in it, only curiosity. He wasn't trying to hurt me. 
It was as if he simply couldn't comprehend why I'd want to talk to him or why he'd be interested in listening. Interesting, he said. Then he turned back to his magazine. Jared always did have a way of frustrating me. In this case, he wasn't holding a conversation with me. I'd imagined this moment thousands of times over the last year. There were so many things that I wanted to say to him. I practiced answering any and all questions that I was sure he'd ask. I had responses to all of them, and I even had answers to his responses to my questions. As usual, Jared wasn't doing what I'd expected. He not only wasn't having a conversation with me, he wasn't refusing to speak to me either. I'd been ready for him to refuse to speak to me. I had a whole speech or three prepared for handling that. Two of them included starting out with things that were outright lies just to draw him into the conversations. But Jared, with his refusing to refuse to speak, yet not actually speaking, avoided them all. He was so different from everyone I'd ever met. He was smart. He was sexy and he danced to the beat of a drummer that seemingly only he could hear. At the same time, if he liked you, he had no problems drawing you into his world and allowing you to hear that drummer and jiggle just a little bit to his unusual rhythm right along with him. Hell, I miss that drummer. When we first got together, both of us were out of college and deep into our 20s. We both started our careers and were both between relationships. I met him through a friend of a friend. She liked him too, but he had simply never noticed her. Guys always talk about how much they hate being locked in the friend zone. I think that we women don't know it, but sometimes guys make a move on us that is totally inappropriate on purpose. They do this because they want to break out of the friend zone. The friend zone is hell to a guy. It means that he can do everything in the world for us, but we're still never going to screw him. We treat the guys in the friend zone like they're girlfriends who just happen to have tools swinging between their legs. We can meet and totally hate other guys. We can think those guys are total a-holes. But those a-holes are still more likely to screw us than the guys in the friend zone are. So sometimes those friend zone guys will grab your bum or your tits, knowing that they're destroying the friendship with us just to get out of the friend zone. To them, it's better to be an a-hole that may someday get laid than to be stuck having to listen to the details of every bad date a woman has been on without the slightest chance of ever screwing her. Anyway, Connie was in Jared's friend zone. She would stop over to watch football with him, even though she didn't know a thing about it. While she was in his apartment, she'd accidentally spill beer all over herself and have to change into something of his. She told me once she wore one of his t-shirts with nothing on under it for a whole game, and he simply didn't make a move. It was very demoralizing for her. She knew he wasn't gay, and yet there she was sitting only inches away from him, but Jared didn't notice. Things like that are hard on a girl's ego. So she decided to fight fire with fire. She pretended that she wasn't interested in him either. She even went as far as to suggest other women that he might be interested in. She wasn't stupid enough to suggest anyone who was more attractive than she was or anyone she thought he might like better, which was where I came in. She brought me over to a party she was hosting and introduced me to him. It was a screwed up situation because I really wanted to help her out. But the problem was the first time I laid eyes on him. I wanted him. At that time, I was 26 years old and working as a secretary. I dated frequently but hadn't found anyone really serious. I wasn't a prude but I insisted that my dates had to take the time to get to know me before we got physical. After we talked and I heard Jared's side of the story, I realized that he was even worse than I was. He simply didn't sleep with women that he didn't really sense a connection with. If he couldn't imagine himself married to you, he simply wouldn't sleep with you. Apparently, we both passed each other's standards because less than two hours after we met, Jared's tool was in me as far as he could get it. My legs were so far apart trying to pull him in me even further that I expected my hips to pop out of their sockets at any second. It felt so good that I just didn't care. I lost Connie as a friend, of course, but shit, it was all her own fault anyway. In a way, Connie had insulted me. She'd only introduced me to Jared because she thought that she was prettier than I was. She also thought that she was built better than I was and she thought that I had no chance with him. It was her loss and her fault. I still laugh sometimes thinking about how she must have felt after introducing us at that party, only to see the two of us leave shortly thereafter. She must have felt really bad to leave her guests just so she could follow us back to my apartment. She waited outside for over four hours until he left, so she could run up to my apartment and confront me. I opened the door thinking that he'd forgotten something. I hadn't even bothered to put any clothes on. I still had bite marks all over my neck. She took one look at me and burst into tears before calling me every kind of 304 and tramp she could imagine. You're not as pretty as I am, she cried. I just nodded my head. Your tits are too small and your butt is way too big, she screamed. 
I nodded my head again. You're a 304. You screwed him on the first date. You didn't actually even go on a date. Again, all I could do was nod my head in agreement with her. What do you have that I don't? She cried. Well, for starters, I said, this is mine and I have no intention of giving him back to you. I slammed the door in her face and ended five years of friendship. But it was also the start of my relationship and eventual marriage to Jared. He was and still is the love of my life. In those first few weeks with Jared, I quickly learned what love really was. We spent almost every possible second together. We spent a lot of that time in bed, but we also spent time getting to know each other's likes, dislikes, and personality quirks as well. There were a lot of days when we'd go to bed with each other and not have sex. We'd simply lay there touching each other. After we got married, it got even more intense. Jared became consumed with making our lives together the best they could be. He bent himself over backwards trying to make and keep me happy. We saved every penny we could to buy our house. The plan was that we'd start preparing for our eventual genetically perfect nuclear children. I noticed after a while that for Jared, while we didn't have very much money coming in from our jobs above what we needed and the little bit that we could save every week, there was a double standard. Jared denied himself even the most inconsequential things, but he'd always splurge on anything I wanted. I didn't realize what he was doing until the summer that he didn't even drive his Mustang once. That way he told me he could save the entire cost of the car's ridiculously high insurance rates. He could also save the increased spending on gas for its powerful motor. I walked away from him shaking my head when I realized that only the week before he'd taken me out to dinner at a very expensive restaurant that I wanted to try and he'd bought me three new outfits that I had to admit I didn't really need. It had started to sink in that this man loved me. He hadn't married me simply because he liked screwing me. He really wanted me to be with him for the rest of his life. He was going to be more to me than the daddy figure to my kids. Jared was the missing piece of my soul. I applied for and got a position at work in the sales trainee program. After six months, I was a full, fledged salesperson. I hadn't fought for accounts and everything. I did notice that my sales weren't nearly as high as some of the guys. I thought it was long-term relationships with their customers or other factors like that. I listened to some of the older salesmen sometimes. I noticed that they all had ways of sweetening their deals. Some of them invited their customers to parties or barbecues. Others played golf or invited their customers to go gambling. But all of those guys got the best accounts in the highest sales numbers and the best bonuses. I guess it was about four years ago. I'd been a salesperson for about three years. One of my best customers was Mick Fleetwood. Mick had been one of my first accounts, but he still only gave me small sales. He sometimes called some of the other salespeople for his bigger sales, even though technically he was my account. Mick was 68 years old and his health was bad. His wife had died a couple of years before that and I'd gone to her funeral. I thought that we had the kind of relationship where I could ask him anything. So I did. I asked him why he gave me all of his regular day-to-day -day small order business, but deferred his big machinery sales to John McVie or even Lindsay Buckingham. He told me that those guys had a way of sweetening the deals for him. It turned out that those guys were getting the randy old sex workers. I was desperate for a bonus so I could stay in the sales force. I really needed to do my part to help Jared save for our house. So I slept with Mick. I really didn't consider it sex. He was 68 years old. Even with Viagra, he could only keep it up for about 10 minutes. There was also the fact that no man alive could compete with Jared when it came to sex. We were just so perfectly matched. We fit so well together and I loved him so much. You simply couldn't compare him to anything else. After a couple of bonuses, the extra income really helped us. After a while, we bought our house and actually seemed to be doing well. Jared had gotten a couple of promotions at work and was now bringing in a lot more money. We traded in his Mustang on a newer and better Mustang. I got a new car as well. We still saved money, but it was more like a rainy day fund. Finally, we began to talk about me giving up my job so we could start having kids. We figured that I'd finish out the year and then give my notice early on in the next year. I was in Chicago having dinner with one of my biggest customers. I wanted to go out on a high note. I wanted to win the highest sales award for that quarter. I'd come close several times before, but neither I nor any female salesperson in the company had ever won it. After dinner, I retired to my room in the hotel with the customer. I was lying there imagining that the 60-year-old guy humping away at me was Jared and we were making a baby. Come on, baby, give me the juice. Make me a mommy, I said. The old creep on me was out of breath and really didn't give a shit what I said, as long as he got some. I could have called him Jared and he wouldn't have blinked. 
That was the way I got through the sex. I just closed my eyes and imagined it was Jared. Of course, it never felt as good as it did with Jared, but your mind can work wonders. Only that last time, something told me to open my eyes. I did, and my world ended. As my eyes focused, I noticed Jared standing there in the open doorway with several of my colleagues and my boss. He had tears running down his cheeks. I tried to push Harvey off of me. He was partially deaf and didn't realize what was going on. No. I screamed. Goodbye, Audrey, said Jared. I loved you. Even as he turned and walked away, I was pulling myself out from under Harvey's bulk. The reactions of the men still in the room, as I tried to dress and follow Jared, were all markedly different. My boss was livid. He stood there turning redder and redder like an old steam furnace. He was going over the facts in his mind, almost as if he was collecting steam before he blew. The tittering expressions on the faces of my colleagues were also varying. I heard everything from, I knew there was a reason my body was outselling me, to hey, we all have our ways of closing a deal. Just before I left the room for the bathroom I heard, shit, I should have been screwing her myself. Harvey was smiling and high-fiving the guys. His newfound studliness by far outweighed any possible damage to his marriage. As I finished cleaning myself up and threw my clothes into a suitcase, I noticed that all of the guys with the exception of my boss, Darren, had gone. The pain and despair I'd felt finally also worked its way out of me. It came out in the form of long mournful wails and sobs. I couldn't stop crying no matter what I did. Darren was trying to explain to me how they'd come to be there. There hadn't been any kind of surveillance on me. There hadn't been an investigation. Darren had discovered that I'd already won the top salesperson award for the quarter. He'd called me to tell me and had forgotten that I was on the road. When he told Jared about the award, Jared had confessed that it would probably be my last trip since we were going to start our family. Both Darren and Jared thought that surprising me with a cake and a little ceremony would be a great idea. Only they were the ones who ended up surprised. He told me that I should probably give Jared some time to get over his shock before I started trying to talk to him. Darren had been married and divorced three times. Wife number four seemed like she'd be the one to stick. He'd been through and seen it all. He'd even been through this once. He tried to explain to me what Jared was feeling or something like it since every person was different. He told me that tomorrow would be soon enough to try to talk to Jared. He told me to get my story straight and be prepared to be humiliated and to take a lot of shit. He told me that it would probably take some time, but that Jared and I loved each other, so he thought that if we fought hard, we could make it. He also told me that I was fired. As soon as I was done packing, I checked out and headed for the airport. My flight wasn't scheduled to leave until the next afternoon. I'd missed the last flight out that day by less than a half hour. Unfortunately, Jared had been on it. When I got back to the hotel, Harvey was sitting and drinking with the guys. I didn't go over to them. I stayed in my room crying and trying to call Jared. He never answered or returned any of my calls. My staying away from the guys didn't stop them from trying to come up to my room though. I was no longer a colleague in their eyes. I was merely a 304. There were no longer any rules of workplace conduct to prevent them from hitting on me. When I flew out the next day, I'd spent the entire night preparing for my confrontation with Jared. I was prepared to get down on one knee and kiss his bum or whatever else he wanted me to do. I expected him to have changed the locks and changed the garage coats. I tried to get into the garage first. My remote worked on the first try. I knew then that as angry as he probably was, it wasn't a deal breaker if he still allowed me access to the garage where his precious Mustang was stored for the winter. As the garage opened, my despair deepened. Jared's Mustang was not only gone, in the middle of winter with snow on the ground, which was unheard of. My car was in the garage. A lot of you won't understand what that means. Jared's car had not only never seen snow, it had never seen rain. Jared only drove that car in the summer on absolutely dry days. The underside of that car and all the rest of it was still showroom new. The car had never been washed in a car wash. He lovingly washed the car every third day, all summer no matter what. It slept all winter in a heated garage and he still washed it to keep dust off of it, even though it was covered. There was only one meaning for this message, he'd left me. Jared was gone and he wasn't coming back. I fell down crying in the garage all over again. As I sat there crying a UPS truck pulled up in front of the house. The driver got down and gave me a big package. It wasn't very heavy. I signed for the package and the driver gave me a cheerful Merry Christmas and left. I knew what was in the box. It was one of Jared's Christmas presents. I bought him a suede and leather jacket with Mustang emblems all over it, so he could remember the stupid car even when he couldn't drive it. 
I noticed a lot of junk piled up in front of the house. I overlooked it as I went to the door and tried my key. It still worked, of course. I didn't know what to expect when I walked into the house. I guess I thought that maybe Jared would have gone crazy and damaged a lot of our belongings and messed up the house. I knew that things could be replaced so I was prepared. But Jared had changed the house in a way that I never expected. There wasn't a single thing out of place. Unlike the usual situation when I traveled, this time the house was as neat as a pin. As I walked through room after room, I noticed that he hadn't taken anything or at least not much. All of his clothes were gone and most of his tools. He'd taken every picture of himself and all of the ones of the two of us he'd simply cut himself out of and replaced them in the frames. If I'd expected to burn off some nervous energy cleaning while I waited for him to contact me, I was disappointed because there was nothing for me to do. It took me a while to figure out what Jared had done. He literally destroyed our home without attempting to do any damage at all. He turned our home into just another house by simply taking all of the love out of it. As I looked around that house, instead of seeing all of the wonderful memories we built there and all of the hopes and dreams we still had of things we wanted to do there, I now saw only a big empty box to keep all of my shit in. Finally, after what seemed like forever squared, the phone rang. It was Mary, our next door neighbor. She said she'd seen lights in the house and figured that I was home. I'd known Mary for years. We met her and her husband on the day we moved in. I figured I'd let her know that Jared had left me. Maybe she'd come over to make me some coffee and console me. She'd actually called to uninvite me to the party they were having this Saturday for Christmas Eve. She called me a few choice names and told me that I deserved whatever happened to me. Obviously, she'd spoken to Jared. Surprisingly, he'd asked her to look out for me and told her that I'd need a friend. I fell asleep on the couch after drinking far too much liquor. I woke up the next morning with a hell of hangover. I hadn't seen or heard from Jared in over 36 hours, and I was going crazy. I wonder why he hadn't called to curse at me and call me names. Didn't he want to yell at me, or at least ask me why? Later that evening, the doorbell rang. I leaped up from the couch and ran to the door. As I opened it, I noticed that there was a bored-looking girl there on the porch. She was chewing gum, and she looked at a list. She read my name off of the list. When I confirmed my identity, the little witch said, Merry Christmas. You've been served. She handed me a thick folder of papers and smirked at me. Then she walked away, still popping her gum, without a care in the world. I opened the folder. Never in my wildest dreams would I have expected it, especially not so fast. They were divorce papers. Jared was asking for a no-fault divorce. He wanted to split everything down the middle 50-50. He'd already taken half of our checking and savings. He was liquefying our investments and would send me a check soon. He'd also removed himself from my 401k plan and sent me the papers so he could remove me from his. He generously filed a quick claim to our house and was giving it to me. He kept his car and his Jeep. I kept my car. If I signed off on it, the divorce would be final in 60 days. There was no way in hell I'd give him up. I intended to get a lawyer and demand my day in court. I wanted to fight for my marriage with every breath I had left. I wouldn't let Jared get out of my life without me having tried my goddamnedest to keep him. It took 75 days in the end, instead of 60. You're expecting to hear that I fought for and got a meeting with him or counseling, right? None of that happened. Even my lawyer admitted that Jared had been way beyond fair. By rights, he should have made me sell the house and split the proceeds with him. I think, in a way, giving me the house was Jared's way of making me suffer even more by forcing me to remember all of the plans we'd made for our lives. I sat there alone in that house, and it was torture. Everything I saw reminded me of what I'd lost. Jared is also one of those people whose absence is felt by everyone he knew. So my neighbors wasted very little time in letting me know how they felt. Less than a week after Jared had gone, I started to feel like I was a tiny island in the middle of a huge lake. I was totally isolated among people who I once thought were my friends. There was also the fact that I couldn't really swing our mortgage without him and I'd have taken a bath trying to refinance it. So I ended up selling it anyway and for a lot less than it was worth. I got another job and started trying to work my way back up the food chain. The problem is that it's really hard to find motivation when you just don't give a shit. The new job was also in sales. For the first few months, I really didn't try very hard so I made hardly any money. I noticed that I was going through my savings at an alarming rate. The cost of my therapy sessions was also killing my bottom line. My new job had no provision for employee pensions, so I really needed to stop bleeding money from my savings account. The therapy was no help. I already knew where I'd gone wrong. I already knew what I'd lost. I'd actually lost a piece of myself. 
I'd given up a piece of my soul and only by getting it back would I ever be whole again. So now it's a year later. I'm fatter, less attractive, and more depressed. I made a wish, and it appears to be coming true, but I guess I'm going to have to work for it a little bit. I don't mind, though, because all I wished for was a chance. Jared is sitting next to me. He's like a life preserver in the middle of a very rough sea, and I'm a drowning woman. There's no way I'm going to let him get away again. While we've been apart, I've done everything I possibly could to keep tabs on Jared. I started friendships and re-established relationships with people just to get information on how he was doing. Some of it required me to belittle myself and eat a lot of shit. Remember that witch Connie? She was the stupid one who gave me Jared in the first place. Connie called me about a week after Jared left me. She couldn't wait to rub it in. I had to listen to her basically call me a piece of shit. I warned him about you from the beginning, she croaked. You just weren't right for him. You dropped your drawers within minutes of meeting him, remember? About 20 minutes into the conversation, I finally got what I'd been waiting for. He really isn't doing well, she said. You hurt him really badly. I've tried everything I can think of to get him to come out of his apartment. I've even tried to go over there and visit him, but he doesn't want to see anyone. Through my patience and her big mouth, I had all of the information I needed. I knew that Jared had moved into an apartment. I also knew that he wasn't trying to date anyone and that he was having as rough a time getting over me as I was getting over him. I found out other news from other places, but Connie was always the one I could turn to when I absolutely needed to know something. She enjoyed letting me know that she knew more about my husband than I did. She loved gloating over the fact that in the end, I wasn't very likely to end up with him. Unfortunately, after a while, all of my information about Jared just dried up. No one seemed to know anything about him. Even Connie had to admit that she didn't know anything that was going on in his life. I'd have paid to find out even the smallest bit of information on how he was or what he was doing. Now, all of a sudden, he shows up, and except for looking a little thinner and a bit more serious, he really looks good. The time apart had apparently been far kinder to Jared than it had to me. Maybe it's because his conscience is clear, while I bear the blame for ending our marriage. I looked over again at my ex-husband as the plane continued to slice through the air cutting the distance between us and our destination by miles every second. It just felt like as I watched him out of the corner of my eye that our time was dribbling away and with it any chance I might have to get him back. How do you sleep? I asked him out of the blue. What? He asked. I actually thought I saw the beginnings of a smile cross his lips. Audrey, you always did have a knack for asking me the most off-the-wall questions, he said. That was one of the things I loved the most about you. And I guess one of the things I missed the most. I was having trouble focusing when he said that. Jared obviously didn't realize how his words had me in a near swoon. I was beginning to feel the magic of the spirit of Christmas working on my behalf again. I might just pull this off. He turned in his seat and actually looked at me. His smile just lit up my entire world. Things were going so well until one of those little plastic flight attendants came into the picture. She asked him if he wanted something to drink. Okay. I know you guys are thinking that I'm blowing this out proportion, but I'm not. That which was tool blocking. Why do I think that? Let me give you the situation. Jared and I are both flying business class. We both get the same benefits and amenities. She walks up and leans across me offering him an unobstructed view of her cleavage to find out if he wanted a drink. Wouldn't the correct procedure be to ask both of us if we wanted a drink? And was it necessary to lean over me and put her titties in his face? The witch also did this long before they even had the drink cart ready to bring around. She saw that Jared and I were talking. She didn't know that we already had a history together. She saw him turn around in his seat and smile at me. She just decided right then and there to shit in my cornflakes. Luckily, it didn't work. Jared just smiled at her and told her he'd wait until the cart came around so he could see what they had. She told him that she'd asked him early in case he wanted something special or something that wasn't on the menu. I asked her if everyone got that opportunity and she just smiled and left without answering. So tell me, was I overreacting? I guess I never expected to see you again, he said, changing the subject and talking to me as if we'd never been interrupted. But then I never expected any of what happened to happen. It was like getting kicked in the teeth. I guess in a way, it was my fault. You see, when I met you, I thought that my life was set. I never imagined that you and I wouldn't be together forever. I never thought that either, I said. I saw a bit of anger flash across his features and he covered it up well. That was another thing about Jared. I never saw him lose his temper. Not once in all of the time we were together. So even that flash of negative emotion spoke volumes about what he'd been going through to get over me. Jared, I love you so much. It hurts me not to be with you, I said. I feel like a part of my soul is gone. 
I had to sell the house. I couldn't be there with the ghosts of us constantly reminding me that we were broken. None of our neighbors would speak to me. I became a pariah. I tried therapy. It didn't help. Nothing helped, Jared. It was as if I died and no one told me. I was just wandering around going through the motions of life, without realizing that I was simply no longer alive. As I said this, a single tear rolled down my cheek. I've been trying so hard to keep myself together. I'd really thought that I was all cried out over this, but finally getting to talk about it to someone who really mattered caused all of those old emotions to surface yet again. Jared handed me a handkerchief. Damn him, it wasn't a napkin or a wet wipe or any of those things. It was a very nice, real handkerchief. Where the hell would he get something like that these days? Okay, he said. I understand this from your point of view. We have this chance meeting. We haven't spoken to each other since it happened. So you see this as an opportunity for what? Closure. His eyes scanned my face and I felt as if every emotion that I'd buried, all of my hopes and dreams were open for him to see. I looked downwards and was rewarded. The floor of the plane was covered in carpet. That was good because if he told me to get down on my knees and beg him, or suck his tool, I'd do it. So, okay Audrey, we're having this talk. You get to have the closure your therapist told you, that you needed. What's in it for me? That was unusual. Jared had never really done anything for his own benefit before. I was beginning to see what I'd done to him. The changes in him were far deeper and yet far more subtle than I'd thought. What do you want, Jared? I asked in a very quiet voice. I hoped against hope that he'd tell me that he wanted me back. Do you know what you did to me? He sneered. As he asked the question, I could tell I'd dredged up memories and emotions that he never wanted to visit again. He buried them so he simply didn't have to deal with them. In order for us to move forward, we were going to have to open that box and take a look at some truly ugly things. I guess I knew that there'd be some anger and some resentment, but I was ready to face them if he was. His voice had been loud enough that the flight attendants both looked in our direction. I could see concern on their faces as they looked at him. The looks that they gave me were far less caring. You were my entire world, he spat. Do you have any idea of how long I searched to find you? Do you have any idea of how special you were to me? Every woman I'd dated before you was always like Connie. All they cared about was what they looked like. The only thing they cared about in men could all be the sum of an equation with three variables. It was like a romantic algebra. The first factor is what the guy looks like. The second factor is how much money he makes or has. The third is how big his tool is. You add those three up and come up with a score. If a guy is lacking in one, but above average in the other two he can still measure up. My mouth dropped open. Not because I was shocked about it but because he'd distilled it with such brevity. He'd made it sound so simple and so mercenary, but it was profoundly true. Don't you think it's demeaning to determine a man's worth or his suitability as a mate with just three variables? He asked. Even those guys who try to screw every woman they meet have higher standards than that for the women they actually intend to marry. That's one of the reasons that I never went around trying to screw every woman I had access to. I knew that I could never be with someone like Connie. She's cute and all of that. But on a deeper level, we just didn't click. So why would I waste my time on her? When I met you, it was different. I'm not saying that you weren't pretty, because you were. But you had some things that Connie just didn't have. I was attracted to you with my body, but my brain and my heart told me that you were the one. Within a few minutes of meeting you, I just knew it. Hearing this now from him made me want to open the door to the plane and just scream out how happy I was. Of course, if I did that, the plane would depressurize and plummet into the ground killing all of the passengers, with Jared and myself among them. The only thing that would probably survive intact would be the airbags inflating that flight attendant's boobs. Audrey, Connie gave me so much shit about deciding that you were the one I wanted to be with. She told me for months that you'd do something like what you did. I never believed her. That's one of the reasons that she and I are no longer friends. After, well, after what happened between us, she tried to help me get over it but she really wasn't a friend. All she ever did was try to rub my face in the fact that she'd warned me about you. And she kept trying to convince me that the answer to my problems was to hook up with her. A friend doesn't try to force you to do something you're just not ready for. So Connie and I are no longer friends. Audrey, I was depressed and just beaten down. For a long time, I didn't go out at all. It was over a month before I even went back to work. I was just devastated. I mean, think about it. The woman I loved, the person I thought I shared my life and my soul with was going out and screwing other guys. I walked in on you screwing a guy old enough to be your grandfather. I closed my eyes and tried to look away from him. He wouldn't let me. He reached out and gently grabbed my face and pulled me back so I was facing him. 
And Audrey, it hurt me even more to know that you enjoyed it more than you did with me, he said. Both of our minds were laid bare, along with our emotions. I was visibly crying then, and there was wetness in the corners of Jared's eyes as well. Would either of you like a DRI? Flight attendant Barbie began before both of us cut her off. You know, we both shouted at the same time. Our reply was far harsher than we'd meant it to be. Everyone in our vicinity noticed it and looked at us. We'll be landing in about an hour, said the flight attendant as she wheeled her cart to the next set of passengers. In a quieter voice, yet an angrier tone, I spoke to Jared again. What the hell makes you think I liked it better with him? I asked. Jared, you a-hole, there was never anyone better than you. There was never anyone who was even as good. Just what stupid logic are you basing this bullshit on? Audrey, he said quietly. I could see that this was really hard for him. Even after all of this time, he was hurting as much as I was, maybe even more. It was what you said. You were begging him to shoot his juice in you and make you a mommy. You wanted that old, fat creep to get you pregnant instead of me. Jared, have you lost your mind? I asked him. I looked at him thinking he was joking or being facetious. As I looked deep into those beautiful brown eyes, there wasn't a hint of deceit. Jared really believed what he'd heard that day. Jared, whenever I was with those guys, it was never about love or sex. I got all the love I needed and all the sex I needed from you. When I was with them, the only way I could go through with it was to close my eyes and imagine it was you on top of me. So, I was pretending it was you that day. It was the only way to get a reaction out of me. If I didn't, I'd just lay there dry as a bone. It would be like they were screwing a blow-up doll. Having sex with you was so much more than a physical act. None of them could ever come close to it. Jared's face changed again. I don't know why I expected him to be happy after hearing that, but I did. His reaction was anything but happy, though. It was like an explosion of pain. Maybe Jared's emotions were like a bunch of chemicals all placed on shelves in his psyche. My answers to his questions had poured some of those emotions out and obviously some of those things should never have been allowed to mix. Then why the hell did you do it? He yelled. Jared's shout in the close confines of the plane echoed like a bomb had gone off. Not only the flight attendants, but two men at opposite ends of the plane stood up and stared at us. I guess we knew who the air marshals were after that. The flight attendants and one of the men came over to us. Sir, said the man, is there a problem here? Should we arrange to have you switch seats? It's my fault, I said. The man looked at me dubiously. We just need some privacy. We'll keep it down. The man looked at us suspiciously. He's my ex-husband, I said. We haven't spoken to each other since the divorce started. Maybe if we'd had a chance to talk then things would be different now. I guess he wasn't expecting some of my answers to his questions. I did a terrible thing to him. When we get off of this plane, we may never see each other again. We'll be very quiet. He shook his head, but he went back to his seat. Jared, this was never about me being unhappy with you. You were always more than enough for me. I am 100% in love with you. We had no problems between us. The problem was me. You always treated me like I was gold. Even when we didn't have any goddamn money, you'd wipe out our savings to buy me something that I really didn't need while you went without. I just needed to try to contribute more to our finances. I wanted to help. I know that it was stupid. I know that it was wrong. But that money really did help us. It took some of the financial pressure off of us and we got our house a lot sooner than we would have otherwise. It didn't cost us anything and we got back. Jared held up his hand for me to stop. He turned away from me and started looking at something on his iPhone. Jared, I said softly and rubbed his shoulder. He pulled away from me again. Audrey, can you please just leave me alone for a while? He asked. I kind of need to process this. After a few minutes, I saw Jared pull out a pad and start writing something. I looked straight ahead. A few minutes later, the flight attendant passed by. I grabbed her arm before she got too far away from me. She looked at me like I'd done something terrible by touching her. May I have my drink now? I asked as nicely as I could. I'm sorry, she began. But the... Which, if you don't get me a drink, you'll wish you had, I said as coldly as I could muster. She nodded her head and came back a few minutes later with a selection of those small drink bottles. I took three of the vodka bottles. You should probably put them in a glass, she said. And we'll be landing soon. I nodded and took the glass she offered me. I sat back and looked around. Most of the passengers in my area who weren't engaged in staring out the window or talking to each other were staring at me. I really wanted to jump up and scream, B-O-O, -O, as loudly as I could. I didn't for two reasons. First, because I knew I'd get arrested. The air marshals and the flight attendants were already sick of me, and if I pushed them any further, my bum was grass. And second, because Stangstar already used that boo, 
thing last year and probably wouldn't do that twice, and if he did, Mike Othebebe would just edit it out anyway. Jared was scribbling away on that pad. It was like the man was trying to write War and Peace in 10 minutes on a legal pad. He wouldn't even as much as look at me and there were so many things I needed to tell him. Just before the plane started to descend, he got up and went to speak to a flight attendant. He took his jacket and his briefcase with him. Bathroom, he threw over his shoulder as he left. I saw a conversation between him and the flight attendant and the air marshal and then I saw him go further back in the plane. A few moments later, airplane Barbie came back and started asking everyone to replace their tray tables and anything that wasn't restrained. We were about to land. I grabbed her shoulder again and asked her about Jared. She said that he was still in the lavatory, but not to worry. He'd be okay if he stayed there during the landing. I wasn't worried about him falling into the miniature toilet if that was what she thought. I was worried about our unfinished conversation. At this point, my ex moss wish hadn't been fulfilled. There were so many things we needed to say to each other. Where were we? Are we going to get back together? Are we going to try to be friends? God, I needed that man back in my life. It was time for us to pick up the pieces and go forward with our lives. I was still having trouble with all of the pain and hurt he'd been carrying around with him. I mean, I guess I always knew that I loved Jared. But it just came as such a surprise to me hearing the things he said and learning the real depth of the love he had for me. I just never thought that a man could love any woman that much, let alone me. I just couldn't stop thinking it over and over again in my mind. He really loved me. Me, plain, ordinary Audrey. My betrayal had hurt him far more than I ever suspected. All this time, I thought that I was the one who was hurting. Maybe us getting back together would be good for both of us. The spirit of Christmas was helping two people, not one. The plane landed exactly on schedule. I looked past Jared's window seat and watched the ground come up as we landed. There in the parking lot as we flew over it. I thought I saw Jared's Mustang GT parked there. Beside me, that car was the only thing he loved. As the plane rolled to a stop, the passengers who'd all been in a hurry to get on resumed their impatience and scurried to get off. Jared still wasn't back from the bathroom and I had so much to say to him. Maybe we could continue our conversation over dinner. I stayed in my seat as the passengers all got off. When the last person had left the plane, the flight attendant came over to me. You have to get off of the plane now, ma'am, she said. I couldn't believe the witch had the nerve to call me ma'am. She was acting like I was an old lady or like I was slow. I'm waiting for my friend to get out of the bathroom, I said. She looked at me with a really concerned expression on her face and sat down next to me. God damn it. It looked like she really cared. He never went to the bathroom, she said. There wasn't an ounce of malice or venom in her tone. She really was trying to be nice. He asked us to let him go to sit in the back, she continued. I guess the things you two talked about were very painful for him. He was having trouble not crying. He asked to sit right by the rear door. That's why he took all of his things with him. We'd never have allowed him to take his briefcase and belongings into the lavatory. He was the first person off of the plane. I was crushed. I started crying then. I just couldn't help myself. The flight attendant that I'd called all kinds of names the whole flight hugged me and rubbed my back. She let me cry all over her uniform. She sat there with me while I poured out the whole story of my relationship with Jared and how I cheated on him. She listened to me talk about how he'd found out and left me and how after a whole year apart I still couldn't face life without him. It was profoundly funny how a woman that I thought hated me turned out to be the best friend I had when I needed her the most. I couldn't remember any of those quotes about the kindness of strangers, but I was sure they all applied. Finally, when I got myself together, she smiled at me and told me that there was always tomorrow. After all, he'd never said that he didn't want to ever see me again, and at least we were talking now. I also knew that he still worked in the same place, so I could find him. I realized then that the things we had to work out were far more than we ever could do in one talk. But I had hoped that someday, we could work them out. As I stood up to leave, she smiled at me again and handed me the envelope she'd been holding. He told me to give this to you, she said. She gave me a letter. It was in an envelope with the airline's logo on it. I looked at it cautiously. I turned it over in my hands as if seeing it from a different angle might change something. Hey, she said, as I walked out of the plane. Have a Merry Christmas. And good luck. Maybe it will be good news. You know how the magic of Christmas works. I smiled back at her and nodded my head. The magic of Christmas was a good thing to consider. As I walked slowly through the airport, I saw one of those electronic signs that look like scoreboards. They give you all kinds of information on anything you'd want to know about your flight. This one was telling me that the luggage was just arriving at baggage claim for my flight. 
Apparently, the flight had been on time but the luggage was late coming off the plane. I looked at my watch. Only seven minutes had passed since the plane landed. If I hurried, I could still catch Jared at the baggage claim. I looked at a map of the airport. I'd flown in and out of this airport dozens of times, so I knew where I had to go. I glanced at the map to see which baggage claim area I needed to go to. I took off running as fast as my slightly flabby legs would carry me. An old man suddenly stopped right in front of me. He bent to look at something in his suitcase. I leaped OJ like over the startled man and came down heavily on my right foot. It hurt like hell, but I continued. The magic of Christmas may have indeed been active. Something was helping me. As I rounded the last corner only slightly out of breath, I stopped and scanned the large room. Just as my eyes neared the exit I saw him. I saw him as clear as day. I could even make out the despair on his face. He grabbed one suitcase off of the luggage carousel and turned towards the exit. Just as I drew in breath to shout his name, I saw his expression change. His face in that instant went from very sad to extremely happy. His eyes were focused on the doorway. He dropped the suitcase and opened his arms. They were the same arms that I so dearly missed having wrapped around me, holding my body in his loving embrace. I knew in that instant that those arms were no longer mine, and they never would be again. She was younger than either of us. She was probably only 26 or 27 at most. She had long dark hair and that creamy Irish skin, with just a smattering of freckles. Her long thin arms and thin but curvaceous legs told me that normally she had a very nice body. Her boobs were huge, but I was sure that was because of her condition. She was very beautiful, but apparently she didn't care about things like that. All of that hair was casually tied to one side with a scrunchie. She was also very pregnant. She walked into Jared's arms like she belonged there. She acted as if my Jared was hers. He hugged her to himself as if his life depended on it and lifted her gently off the floor. She leaned her perfect chin up and their mouths meshed into one. He kissed her gently but intensely. She did that thing that women in movies did back in the 40s. As she kissed him back, one of her legs folded up. I let the breath I'd drawn in to shout his name wish harmlessly out. Instead of calling his name, it became a forlorn moan. I slumped back against the wall after deciding to wait until they'd gone to pick up my luggage. She molded herself into his side as they walked out of the door. I hated that little witch with a passion so intense it would make the sun seem like a candle. You know how they don't let you park at the curb at airports? Maybe it was because the little witch was pregnant, but they let her. She threw Jared the keys to his Mustang GT and I saw them drive off a few moments later, after stowing his luggage in the car's minuscule trunk. I watched the Mustang GT's dual three-bar lights fade in the distance and with them went any hope of my Christmas wish coming true. The lump in my throat was so big that I was having trouble breathing. My eyes were wet from tears I had yet to shed and I knew that this cry was going to be a big one. I tried my best to compose myself because I really didn't want to break down in the airport and start bawling in front of a bunch of strangers who would only use my pain as something to talk about. I could imagine them gathered around their dinner tables with their families, talking about the crazy old woman who sat there in the airport crying her eyes out for nothing. As I shuffled into the baggage claim area, the carousel was still running. There were only two suitcases still on it. One of them was mine. My ankle was beginning to really hurt. I got to the carousel just as my bag went by. I snatched at it and missed falling heavily to the floor. I heard a laugh from somewhere, so I was sure that my athletic performance had been funny to someone. My ankle hurt even more. The bags went around in a huge circle and most of it was outside of the room. So I had to stand there and wait for the bag to go all the way around the circuit again. When it came back around I grabbed it and walked out through the door towards the parking lot. I asked the bag check guy at the curb when the next shuttle would come through. He told me that I just missed one and would have to wait about 20 minutes for the next one. I wasn't sure that I could keep it together for that long. So I decided to walk all the way to the parking lot. Merry Christmas, ma'am, he said cheerfully. His voice sounded like the one that had laughed when I fell on my bum reaching for my bag. Bah humbug, I replied, causing him to laugh again. By the time I'd walked all the way to my car, my ankle was throbbing. I threw my suitcase in the back seat and got in. I started the motor and turned the heat and defrosters on. Sitting there in the darkness of the car as it warmed up, I finally let all of the feelings I'd been holding in go. I sobbed long and hard. I cried not only because the spirit of Christmas had lied to me, but for the fact that I'd now truly lost the only man I'd ever loved. My despair turned to anger after a while. I was pissed at the spirit of Christmas. I was pissed at Jared, and I was pissed at that pregnant little cow who'd rubbed herself all over him in public. All of this Christmas shit was for the birds. It never worked out this way in any of those movies. Yeah, 
I'll bet it's a wonderful life. I wiped my face and got ready to drive home. Before I put the car in gear, I spotted the envelope form Jared on the seat beside me. I picked it up and opened it. Two pages back in front of Jared's distinctive scrawl. Jared as usual got right to the point. There was no opening salutation. He just mentioned my name so it was clear who he was talking to and launched into his points. Audrey, I'm sorry to do this to you. But after our conversation, I found myself in far too emotional a state to continue. In actuality, we never even got to finish the conversation, but you told me too many things that required time and distance for me to process. The first thing that you need to understand is that walking away from you was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I had no choice though because what you'd done had left me devastated. I had no idea what I'd done to cause you to stop loving me, but I knew that it had to be an immense mistake for you to go that far. When we parted, I spent weeks in a cocoon of depression and despair, wondering why, among other things, you had never bothered to tell me the areas where I was so inadequate that you needed to seek solace in the arms of a man old enough to be your grandfather. Try as much as I could, I was unable to discern my problem. You always seemed to be happy when we were together, and you always seemed to be fulfilled when we made love. I began to think that maybe you were just being nice to me or didn't want to hurt my feelings, so you looked for what you needed on the side. For a long time, I never thought that I should even try to find anyone else. I've always told you that my requirements in a mate were very rigorous and very unique. Look at how long it took me to find you. I always told you that it was like looking through a haystack and trying to find not only a needle, but a golden needle. I never thought that I'd find that again. I need a special type of woman. I need a woman who looks at me not with her eyes, but with her heart. I was very sure that I'd go through the rest of my life alone, constantly reminded of what I'd once had and had lost. Imagine my surprise when I met Corinne. The reaction between us was very much like when I first met you. Of course, I was more cautious with her after what happened with us. But the bottom line is that I really didn't want to go through the rest of my life alone. I'm the kind of man who really is only happy when I have someone to love. As much as I tried to fight off my feelings for Corinne, they simply continued to grow. Within a few weeks, we both knew that we were meant for each other. Audrey, Corinne is not a replacement for you. She's simply another chapter in the book of my life. Her chapter will hopefully last longer than yours did, but it won't be any better or any worse for that matter, just different. Speaking with you today brought back a lot of wonderful memories. I'm sure that had we not parted, we'd have grown old together and done all of the things we dreamed about and I'd have died a very happy man. But it simply wasn't meant to be. For a long time, I guess I'd forced myself not to even think about our time together or how or why it ended. I never for a second considered that it might not be my fault. Speaking with you today also angered me, because I lost what was until we parted, the most important thing in my life, for nothing. Audrey, unless you were lying to me today, there was never a reason for you to do what you did. Remember back when we were together, and we talked to lots of couples who'd been married for longer than we had. All of them started out struggling just as we were. In their later years, they always looked back favorably on the times they did without. They always loved talking about the times when it was the two of them against the world. As you said, what you did got us our house in a shorter period of time, but it also ended our marriage. Thinking back on it now, I'd much rather have struggled for a few more years and still been together than had you doing what you did and losing you. To be totally truthful, the information you gave me today was a huge weight off of my shoulders. I no longer have to worry about disappointing Corinne the way I thought I'd done you. I'm also more relieved, because Audrey, you couldn't have loved me the way I did you. The whole time that we were together the thought of being with someone else would have made me sick. It obviously didn't affect you that way since I now know that the old bastard I caught you with was neither the first, nor the only one. In closing, I'd like to begin by answering your original question. On the plane, you asked me, how do I sleep? You told me that you'd been having trouble sleeping since we parted. Well, Audrey, so have I. I've been having trouble sleeping for about a year now. At first, it was because I missed you so much. Then it was because I was so afraid of failing Corinne the way I thought that I'd failed you. Lately, it's because sleeping with a very affectionate pregnant woman is awful. She constantly moves trying to find a comfortable position with the weight of her tummy pulling her to the side. At the same time, if I move away from her, she tracks me down and wraps herself in my arms no matter how uncomfortable I am. Besides that though, and with the new information you gave me today, I'm sure I'm going to sleep very well from now on. No matter how uncomfortable I may be, I'll be sleeping with a woman who loves me and grades our life not on how much money we have, but on the good times we have together and the way we treat each other. I bear you no bitterness, Audrey. 
and if you need closure or forgiveness, it is granted. I truly hope that you can move on with your life the way that I have. Talking to you lifted a lot of the guilt about our parting from me, because I now realize that it wasn't my fault at all. I've also realized that it was all in the past and none of it matters anymore. Have a Merry Christmas, Audrey. He hadn't even bothered to sign it. I read the letter again and folded it back into its envelope and drove home uneventfully. I thought about his words all the way there. How the hell could I have let someone who loved me that much get away? Why was I angry at him? Jared hadn't done anything except everything he could for me the whole time we were together. It was my fault that we divorced, no one else's. As far as being angry at his new wife, I had no right to feel that way either. She was smart enough to grab him and appreciate him when I practically threw him away. I pulled into the parking lot outside of my crappy little townhouse. I walked up to my door and opened it. Another crappy night in front of my crappy TV with my perverted cat awaited me. Ho, ho, ho merry effing Christmas. I hope I wasn't out of tuna. Just after I stepped into the living room, I wondered where my cat was. Maybe like in It's a Wonderful Life, the point was for me to appreciate the things I have more and take a serious look at the things I've lost. Maybe it was a case where after what I'd done there was simply no Christmas wish or Christmas magic left for me. My phone rang and I answered it. It was the kid from down the street that I'd paid to watch and feed my cat while I was away. The kid was bawling his eyes out as he told me about how he opened the door and the cat ran out of the townhouse and into the street where he was quickly flattened by a truck passing down the street. The truck never even slowed down. I sat down at my kitchen table and poured myself a really strong drink. I began to seriously think about all of those statistics concerning holiday self-deaths. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section and don't forget to like, share and subscribe.